Welcome to the next instalment on Second Chance, Gambling Addiction and Mental Health Recovery. Um, my name's Kieran, I'm here with Richie Paxton and Richie's here to tell his story. He's been through, let's say, a fair few uh, traumatic times in his life and he's, he's also suffered at the hands of addiction um, and he's, he's now hoping to spread the awareness of addictions and hopefully help even just one person out there through telling his story, obviously answering any questions and hopefully we can put across um, a good instalment just to spread the awareness as I, as I say quite often. So I'll start right at the beginning Andy, um, if you want to come in and just basically tell us how your story unfolded and um, along the way if you want to have a break off. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so well, I left school um, sixteen. Uh, got a got like a football scholarship. Um, went to play football for for Darlington Football Club, who were at the time in the third division. Um, so it was like a childhood dream, really. You know, I'd, I'd got the the job I always wanted and had high aspirations at that point in my life. And uh, obviously, started training every day as soon as I left school. Uh, in and around the football, uh, there was a lot of a lot of gambling going on, and it, it didn't really consume us that much. And I didn't really get involved that much. But with being sixteen, we used to get the train backwards and forwards to training, and, and at the train station there was uh, like one on bandits and stuff. So while we were waiting for trains, we used to spend a lot of time on the bandits, uh, and that kind of was my first sort of hook. You know, it was the hook that, that kind of got us and. And that was my first introduction to gambling. As my football went on through the first year, it wasn't too bad. And I was doing all right. I was, I was getting chances in the reserves and stuff like that. So I was quite happy for the age I was at. And then um, I went on a night out and, and we ended up in a bit of a fight on a night out. And I broke my jaw and that was injury, basically. And, that, and it was I was 17 at the time and got injured. I uh, didn't play for for about nine months after that, you know, which was basically my full second year, uh, fractured my jaw. Um, and and that was when gambling really started to take a grip a little bit. I, I've always said my first addiction was football. Because when I was playing football, I, I felt like somebody else, you know. I, I, I was I was away from my normal life. As a child growing up, I was full of fear. I was had no self-worth and I lacked a lot of confidence. So when I played football, I felt like somebody different. Um and, on, and suddenly I, I got injured and that football was took away from us and, and I tried to try to get on the best I could but I ended up finding myself after being a training on a morning I would, I would spend afternoons in the boobies and stuff you know and it was it was a it was an escape for us it was I didn't I didn't know how to handle my life at that moment because it felt like everything was falling apart um, so we, so I obviously started with smaller smaller bets and obviously as you know they, they grow over time. Um, at the end of my second year, we had a little chat with the football club, and I decided that uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to continue, and I still like had a year left on my contract and stuff. So I was I was looked after quite well, um, and I and I went to university. And the reason being was my girlfriend at the time was pregnant, um, and I thought I'm at all, and it's not the Premier League, you know. If if I get if I don't make it here, then what chances have I gotten? I thought I'd be best off going and getting some sort of degree and, and providing for my family, really. And um, so yeah, so so that finished in in about the May time. And um, come the October, my girlfriend went into labour very early, and and we had a little boy called Dylan, and unfortunately he died. Um, so so he, he he isn't with us now, and and that was kind of between that four or five month period. Um, I had two massive things to deal with, you know, that the, the the loss of my career as a footballer, which was my boyhood dream, you know, and then obviously this sort of tragedy, this trauma around around a son. And and if you can imagine seventeen year old finding out you're gonna be a dad, it's quite traumatic anyway, and you go on this roller coaster ride and then everybody finds out about it and then it's not too bad and we've got loads of support and then something like that happens and um I just didn't know how to handle it, basically. Uh, and if and if we go back to what I said before, you know, as a child I was full of fear, I was lack of self worth, I, I didn't have much confidence. So when that happened, 
I just totally shut off from the world, really, and I, I didn't know how to handle it. And, and that's when my gambling went to a whole new level, you know. Um, I had student loans, I had money put away, I had... I was in, I was all right. I was still had a had a part time job in a gym, and um, I had good money, but but every single penny just went straight away, you know. And and it started off with fivers and ten pound bets, and it and it just escalated from then. Snowballed. Um, that was all the way through university. I would gamble basically, and and when I left university, I got a I got a job in the NHS, and it was it was all right job, and I enjoyed it. But still, at this point now, I was 21 and my life was totally consumed by gambling. Um, so the first thing I thought about when I when I left to go to university, I'd call in the bookies on the way. I'd straight in the bookies as soon as I'd left the lecture. Um, I'd done anything that I possibly could to, to earn some extra money. Um, and at the time, I was playing like non-league football, which is kind of like semi-professional football. So we still got a little bit of money and paid for that as well. And, and what you found was like, it was a massive part of going to football, you know, what's your football accumulator, what's your bets on, you know, we'd play football, we'd go in the bar after, we'd see what the results were coming in and, and it was a big part and, and it was all right doing that, but everybody else would do that and then go home or, or go on a night out or go and do whatever and it, and it consumed me and if I hadn't won, I'd then start chasing bets and and I was getting in quite deep, you know, and I, I'd, I'd lost all my student loans and I'd lost every penny I'd basically had and and then I started getting loans and overdrafts and stuff. So I was getting into debt as well as the money I was earning. I, it was all going. Um, and, and once I left uh, university, um, what was happening was Monday to Friday, I was gambling, losing thousands of pounds sometimes. And the weekend would come and to t- try and deal with that. Well, not deal with it, but instead of dealing with it, I would just go on the drink, you know, and I would just drink in excess just to get rid of that pain that was that was hanging over us because of the money I'd lost um, and and the drinks was it started off with a drink and recreationally using drugs and cocaine and stuff like that and then that snowballed as well you know as time goes on at about 22 I decided I needed some help and some support so um, I got in touch with GAM care and went for counselling um, probably forced a little bit by my mother but I, I admitted that I had a problem with, with gambling, you know, and it was the first time I admitted it. And I went to this counselling, and the first thing I was asked was, um, what are you here for? I said, oh, my life's upside down. It's, it's a mess. I'm, I'm losing money. I'm in loads of debt. I'm gambling all the time. And she said, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to stop gambling, or do you just want to learn how to control it? And I was like, whoa, champion, I can, I can just learn to control this. You know, I don't need to stop. Yeah. You know, And that was like a green light for me to say, well, I can just if I can just learn to control it, that'll be champion, you know. Because I didn't really want to stop because I loved it. I loved the buzz yeah. that I got from it, but I knew it was it was it was detrimental to me as a person, and it was causing us to be a nasty, horrible person at times. But I didn't really want to stop. So anyway, I done this counselling, and it, it helped a little bit, and it sort of it sort of slowed the gambling down a little bit, and, and slowed the progression down a little bit, but. Well, ultimately, about six months later, I was back to where I was, you know, and it, the stakes were higher, um, the debt was piling up, um, my mental health started to suffer, I started to hide things, I started to tell lies all the time, I was very manipulative in, in the, the way I went on, um, and, and if there's people who are gambling, you know, they'll, they'll probably relate to a lot of things I've just said there, you know, we, we lie our way out of anything, we try and hide bank statements, we try and hide debt, we try and hide like, credit card bills, all this stuff was happening and, and it was it was just proper, proper massive overconsumption of of all kinds of emotions. And like I said earlier, I couldn't deal with emotion. So once I got into that spiral, I didn't know how to get out of it. And what I should have been doing was asking for some help or some support or, or getting in touch with somebody, you know, and, and doing stuff. But I was petrified to ask for help. I was scared. You know, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it, but I couldn't stop doing it. I'd wake up in the morning with £10 in my bank and I knew I was going to go straight to the bookies and try and turn that £10 into 20 and 30 and, and so on. And it just sometimes happened, sometimes didn't. But ultimately, I ended up with nothing yeah. every single time. Um, and, and people think gambling, you just lose money, you know. But for me, I lost a lot. I lost relationships. I lost friends. I lost family. Um, I lost... I lost jobs and, and not directly. I didn't directly lose a job because of gambling, but because my time was so consumed with gambling, 
I didn't perform very well at jobs. So what would happen is I would run before I got kicked, you know, and um, I would move on to a new thing. And, and it was all getting too much for us. And I was doing more and more. The more, ga- the more I gambled, the more I would drink new drugs on a weekend. You know, and the two went hand in hand and they were just getting bigger and bigger. So um, it's just circle. Yeah, horrible vicious circle, you know, and, and once you start, once I, ultimately what I've learned now is don't do one thing and you'll have to lead on to doing the other, you know, but, but that took a long, long time. And when I was about 25, I moved to Manchester because so I thought if I get away from here and I'll have a new start, but ultimately what happened was I went to Manchester and I took my head with us yeah. and that's where all of my problems were, was in my head. It wasn't with the people I was hanging around with or anything else, it was just ultimately with me in my head and... I had to try and um, start a new life in Manchester, so to speak. Didn't happen, you know. Got there. I think I'd been there three days and I'd already applied for a six grand loan, you know. Um, I was earning decent money then and every penny went. Every penny, every single penny. Um, I stopped with a friend in Manchester and I didn't even have to pay any rent for a period of time and stuff. And it was just every single penny was, was going on gambling. Um, and it was horrible. Uh, after a few years in Manchester, I decided that I needed help again. So I moved back to the northeast. Uh, I'm from Newcastle, well, from a place called Washington, which is in between Newcastle and Sunderland. And I moved back there um, and I tried to get help again. I went to counselling, back to counselling through GAM Care. And at first, I went to GA this time as well. I um, thought I'm going to try and get a bit different support. And, Gee, it was, was good. It gave us some accountability. I went and spoke to other people who were in the same thing and, and they gave us some lots of good advice, which was good advice for me at first, but um, in the end, it it sort of caused a, a few problems, you know, so things that were, that were saying were like, pass your money over to other people, don't have control of any money, ban yourself from all the bookies, ban yourself from all the apps, do all them sorts of things, which are, is fantastic advice and is definitely where I would recommend for people to start. But what happened with that was I started building up resentments against my parents who were controlling my money and not giving us money when I wanted it. And it started lot, lots of friction. And, and like, again, what happens when I'm, I'm in a position where I'm conf- confronted about stuff is my head goes, you know. And what's my only way of dealing with with my head going is gamble, yeah. drink, drugs, you know. And, and that was the only coping strategy I knew. And... I couldn't deal with my mental health. I couldn't deal with all them things, you know. And, and the only thing I knew to, to change the way I felt instantly was to gamble. The gambling and then the drink, the drink and the drugs and, and so on, you know, back into that circle. And this happened, like, every time I tried to get help, I would go back through this cycle. Um, and then I, I was, I had, I had a little boy. I thought everything would change when my son came. Um, and it didn't. It got worse. Because when your son comes, you have more responsibility. Yeah. You have more sort of you have more people depending on you. Need good for my head, you know. Need good for my mental health. Fear, anxiety going through the roof because I'm thinking, how do I provide for my son? I can't even keep my pay packet for a week, never mind a month. How am I going to do all the things I need to do? So again, that caused problems, and I ended up splitting up with my partner through it and stuff, and um. Yeah, we decided, anyway, we, we got back together. We had another child. I thought, this is it. It's going to be perfect this time. But it's gone straight away, you know. Months after my second son was born, my relationship was down the pan. And, and it was all down to not being able to deal with life on life's terms and, and not being able to deal with what was going on in my head. I just needed an escape. And the only escape I knew was to run to them three things. Um, horrible situation to be in. Absolutely horrible. And um it was a struggle, real, real big struggle. Uh, after, not long after that, uh, I met somebody else and we got in a relationship and and it, it things were, were not too bad, but I was hiding stuff, you know. I was I was just thought I was having an affair because I was spending hours away on an afternoon, but I was just in the bookies having bets, you know. So kind of was having an affair, but I was in the bookies with the bookies and not not a person, you know. And again, it caused trust issues, and then I was hiding money and I was doing just crazy stuff that that's insane really and and this was about 10 years 12 years this has been going on for now in my life and at any rate I, I got into quite a bit of debt and I ended up going home crying one day and said I need some help and 
I went back to GA, and this time it was I found it much better, um, much better support. There was more meetings available, uh, and lots of different people. The first time I went to GA, I found everybody was pretty much the same, giving the same advice. Where second time there was more variety of stories, so I could relate with different people in different ways. And I'd done great for nine months, but through that nine months, um, what I will say is the only thing I ever I'd admitted to was having a problem with gambling. So even though my drinking drugs were excessive and it was always blamed on me gambling because if I didn't gamble, I would never went and used the drinking drugs. So when I stopped gambling, I spent stopped gambling for nine months and the drinking drug usage went through the roof and it went from just being a weekend thing to being a, a full week thing, you know, and I was having cocaine on a Tuesday and drinking whiskey on a Wednesday and it was just mental. My life went mental. And ultimately, it was the same thing. I couldn't deal with my feelings or emotions. And because I didn't want to gamble, I just went straight to the drinking drugs. Yeah. And it was horrible. And then after about nine months, um, I had a big relapse with the gambling. And th- this relapse was the best thing that ever happened to us. You know, I lost a fortune in money. But what it showed us was I needed to change drastically, you know. And, and for about a month or so after that relapse, I was trying and I was doing things that I should be doing. Um, the best I possibly could, but you know, ultimately it didn't work. It didn't work. You know, I was still going off and having a little bet and thinking, oh, well, I'll, I'll just have one more and this will be my last day and all that sort of thing. Um, and then my mum one day came in and said, oh, look, here, I think there's a few numbers for you. Um, one was for Sport and Chance, which is a rehab centre who work with uh, professional sports people or, or ex professional sports people. And, and um, she planted the seed, you know. But I didn't take action then straight away. You know, it was about another six weeks after that. Um, I went and had another bet and lost a few grand. And, and I thought that was it. I, I just wanted out of here. I wanted to end my life, basically. And when I was about 28, I started fantasizing about killing myself and jump, jumping off, off the Time Bridge in Newcastle. That was, was my big fantasy. And this went on and consumed us for about two or three years. It was always there. It was always part of my life, you know. And I always knew that that's how I was going to die. And at 29, 30 year old, like it's not something you should be thinking. Um, and anyway, this day I, I, I thought, right, I'm, I just need to get out, you know. And I went to the Time Bridge and stood there and cried my eyes out. And ultimately, I, I just didn't have the balls to do it, to be truthfully honest. I had two kids, you know, and I didn't want them growing up with a dad who, who committed suicide. And, and these things were going through my head. And ultimately, I just didn't have the bottle. I didn't have the bottle. And, and a woman stopped and started talking to us, you know, and, and she could see I was distressed and stuff. And and that, that day I went home and got the number my mum had given us six weeks before and rang Sport and Chance. Um, and I went into rehab. I went into rehab for, for a month. Um, and still at this time, my only problem was gambling, you know. So I went to Sport and Chance saying, oh, I've just got a problem with gambling. And on day one when I was in Sport and Chance, the counsellor there, both the councillors had had lived experience, you know, they both wanted being, um, yeah, they were both in recovery, you know, so they both knew kind of the story, you know, and, and, and one of them said, oh, have you had problems with drinking or drugs? And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, not really. And he was like, how often do you use them? And I was like, well, I can't a bit like, but it's not a problem, you know. Um, have you been in trouble with the police? Yeah, have you been... Mental health suffered through drinking drugs, yeah. If you broke up relationships, yeah. Everything he asked us, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, and he said, what What, what do you think? And I said, I'm just completely fucked on that. Like, and, and that was ultimately what I said to him, you know. And it was like, I didn't see a way out. And he was like, well, fantastic, great. And I was like, what do you mean, great? He was like, you've just owned up to it. You've just admitted it. Yeah. And that's the first step, you know. That's the first step to, to getting well is you've admitted it. You're here now for 28 days and, and we can help you. You know, we can help you set a foundation to to go and change your life if you want to. And he said, like, it's not easy. You'll have to do some work. You'll have to look at yourself. And this is the first time anybody, bearing in mind it was 11, 12 years after the first time I'd seen a counsellor, first time anybody ever said, you will have to do some work. Yeah. You know, even when I went to GA, everybody was saying, get other people to do the work, you know, give them your money, let them pay your bills, let them manage your finances, like ban yourself from bookies so the bookies won't let you in, you know what I mean? It wasn't me looking at me and wanting to change. It was everybody else had to do the work for us and I just had to abide by what they said or do what they said. And this was the first time I had to look at myself and um, it was it was life-changing, completely life-changing. And 
And what the council is, what the council has done, so it was a 12-step recovery, so they introduced us to the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, basically, which is what most um, fellowships use. Um, and they introduced us to that, which was great. But what the council has done, they give us an opportunity to explore the deeper, darker reason why I turned to the drink, the drugs and the gambling. And that was down to them things I mentioned before. It was the inability to deal with my emotions, the inability to, to manage what was going on in my head. And they give us tools and techniques to try and I come away from there with like a toolbox of stuff that I could could then try, you know, things like meditation and gratitude lists and, and um, picking up the phone and speaking to somebody, you know, and, and, and sort of had a community of people and friends that I could speak to. And that was my first step. Come out, come out of then and went in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and I chose Alcoholics Anonymous because they were much more focused around 12-step recovery than uh, Gamblers Anonymous was, you know. And and I felt like I needed that. And I was told to do 90 meetings in 90 days, and I ended up doing over 110, you know. And, and I was like, right, this is it. I'm, this is, this is going to be my saviour. And all I was doing was just doing whatever I felt I had to do at that time. People would say, do this, and I'd go and do it. People would say, do that, and I'd go and do it. And, and it helped us, you know. It, it took us away from that obsession of wanting to bet. It took us away from that obsession of wanting to use drugs. Um, and I started to learn techniques and strategies to deal with me anxiety, with me, me lack of self-worth and, and other things. And, and this, this story's, the story's been good, you know. On the 29th of this month, I'll be a 1,000 days, 1,000 days, um, which is massive achievement for me. You know, I didn't think it was possible. But ultimately, it's just I've done one day a thousand times. <laughs> That's all I have to tell myself now. Um, wake up today and don't bet. Uh, obviously, Gambles and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was great for us, and, and it still is. Um, but it wasn't enough for me. Like I wanted to be a better person, so I went and done lots of self-development and done lots of courses and and I ended up on a degree, doing my counselling degree. So I've got a few months left of that and then I want to start hopefully giving back like like those counsellors did to me in rehab. You know, they give us a platform to change my life and, and hopefully moving forward I'll I'll have that opportunity to do that as well, you know. So so yeah, I'm uh, very grateful today, you know, I have a very out different outlook on life, you know, what I what I once thought I would get through gambling. I now get through just being at peace and and find another ways to to entertain myself really and and um and yeah uh, what I would say is is anybody that's listening and, and can resonate with any of that and feels like they're struggling then pick up the phone you know just just speak to one person any person um and take it from then and I found once I started to learn how to talk and open my mouth my problems started to get a lot lighter, you know, and it started to get a lot easier. Um, uh, like, I had over £100,000 worth of debt uh, through gambling, and and now I'm debt-free, you know. I'm a 1,000 days in recovery, and I'm, I'm debt-free, so anything's possible. Um, but you've got to you've got to stop with destructive behaviour. And as soon as you stop with destructive behaviour, you can, you can change your life around, you know, and and yeah, um, that's me, mate. That's that's the, no, the story. It's incredible, and I think without just saying it, you really should be proud of of changing your life around. Because, like you said, you've you've been in situations where the people have said, "Get someone to do this, get someone to do that," and I believe it. They are helpful tools, but actually. It, a lot of it comes down to working on yourself and putting the work in and, and dealing with things you are struggling with and uh, I think you've done that tenfold it, it, pardon the pun um, and to come like you've said round almost in the full circle especially from that moment when you said you was on the bridge in Newcastle to, to yeah. where you are now I think that's just a beaming light of inspiration to anyone or you, you, you sometimes, you know, get to that place, and don't get me wrong, I've been there myself where I, I almost feel that the self destructive behavior, the gambling, and whatever else, addiction, it's, it's not all right, but 
if all those fails and it goes wrong, I'll kill myself. And I don't mean that flippantly. Like it, it's an option and it's a good option. And, but it's like, like you said, you was toying with that idea for a few years. It, it's in there and back in my. But when it, yeah, when it, I, th I think it's um, it enters a lot of people's heads at certain times. You know, especially if they've got an addiction, it can be quite common. Um, but when it's when it's obsessive, for, yeah. and it was obsessive for a long time. And I even knew exactly what part of the bridge I was jumping off and stuff and all that sort of stuff, you know. And, and it's not normal. It's not normal behaviour. It's not normal things to think like that. And, and um, yeah, I didn't. Ultimately, I didn't. I didn't. I'm still here today, you know. And, uh, yeah, I think, what, what's meant to be in life will be, won't it? I think, like, when you in that, like you said, when people are thinking like that and mm. they almost see it as when it is actually you're on the bridge or you're taking the tablets or you're putting the noose up and there's no other way out. It's important to open up, A, open up and speak, but also open up, you almost open up your mind to listening to stories and listening and, and get, engaging with people who have been there because look at yourself, you, you, you've been on that bridge, you've been in that place and look at you now and I think... The more people who will see success stories in that respect, such as yourself, and the more awareness that comes around about people who have been there and come back from the brink, it's it's a massive positive. And I encourage anyone who is maybe at that stage, if if you can surround yourself, I don't mean constantly look at stories, negative stories of people who are suicidal, but people who have been there and gone to that length where they feel there's no other way out and then come back from the brink I think that's something that's really powerful and can be beneficial and your story is is second to none when it comes to that um, I would ask a sort of question around your early life, I know you said um, when you were playing football and you, you sort of said about if I can't make it at Darlington what can I, where do I go from there and then you were on about your early years when you sort of had self-doubt and things. Do you think it almost went hand in hand, glove in glove? Well, you're doubting yourself with football, you're doubting yourself early on in your life. Almost, what I'm trying to get at, do you think there was almost something there where you feel as much as you tried to live a normal life and maybe work and bring money in and things like that, well... I'm no good anyway, sod it. I'm 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 what, what Yeah, I I'm think I think of? from being from being very young, um, especially when I got into the second secondary school, uh I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. Um I, I played a lot of sport, which was kind of my escape when I was a teenager, especially and and I wasn't I was I was quite clever at school. I, I was in good sets at school and stuff. But generally, the people I was in good sets with weren't the sporty people. And I kind of like had different groups of people, but I didn't really belong to any of them. Um, and when I was in lessons and stuff at school, I just I was so scared to put my hand up and ask questions in case I got it wrong. Um, I would go to trials for football teams. Uh, everybody else, knowing the fact I would get picked, me doubting the fact that I didn't think I had the ability you know, when I got offered a contract at, at Darlington, I was I couldn't believe it. I was like, eh, why did they give it to me and not somebody else? You know, and it was complete something that's gone through my life for for thirty years of it, especially was was um, self doubt. You know, yeah. constantly self doubt. And the other thing that really um, I found out when I was in rehab was I never asked the question. Like um, I never wanted confrontation. So I just wouldn't ask a question. And I was so scared of rejection. I didn't want to ask the question in case I was rejected at any point. Yeah. You know, so I spent a lot of time not playing football in my second year. But like the last probably two months, I could have started playing again. And at no point did I ever go back to the manager and say, what's happening? Am I going to get a game? Yeah. I just didn't. I was so scared to do that. And ultimately that looked like to him that I didn't care anymore. Yeah. I didn't want to be there. 
but it wasn't that. It was just I, I didn't know how to express with me feelings and I didn't know how to talk. And me mum and dad were very working class people and, and they'd done everything they possibly could for us. But me dad worked on the buildings and was painting decorator and stuff like that. And he was a man of few words and he never expressed his feelings and thoughts and stuff. And I just didn't know how to do it. I'd never seen it. I'd never seen men talk. You know, and I think that's something that we is more on the um, agenda now around mental health and stuff is like men reaching out and asking for help and yeah. sharing how they feel and all that sort of stuff. And I think it's so, so important. But at the time when I was going through my teens, like I just didn't have them skills. I no. didn't know how to do it. I think like with what you're saying about expressing and you, your father maybe didn't do that it's almost like learned behaviour in some respects. You, you, if, you yeah, don't, totally. if you're not seeing it at home, you're not uh, around you, you're not sort of doing it in your own life sort of thing. And I think what what you've just said there with the whole awareness around mental health, get men talking, get anyone talking who's struggling, but in particular there's a push to get men talking at the minute. Um, I think it also goes into the fact when you... There's almost a fear, I believe, in, and I, I'm hoping we can break down this as a society. When you're with a bunch of friends or two or three friends, you, your friends, it's not, it's almost a fear of, uh, how can I put it, not fitting in. Um, you know, if you've got two or three friends and they all like a gamble, just for talking sake, gamble, they like a gamble, is it a fear? that people carry where they are gambling too much, they are heading into a, a deep di addiction, but it's they won't they feel they won't fit in, they they're frightened of not fitting in because, oh, Dave can't have a gamble this weekend, he's got a problem with it. Is it that fear? Um that they'll be I think definitely definitely men, especially men. I can only talk about men because I'm a man. I'm sure women feel the same as well, but especially men, initially for me, going asking for help, one of the big things was I'll not be able to go out with them and I'll not be able to see them and I'll have no friends, you know, and, and, and it's not the case at all. Real friends are there to support you, you know. Um, real friends are the ones that that make the time and make the effort to, to come and see you, you know, and, and it doesn't always have to revolve around a bet or a pint or, you know, go, go, go to nightclubs and all that sort of stuff, you know. There's this, for me, I've, I've done stuff since I stopped all that that I've, I've dreamt of doing all my life but could never do it because I never had the money or I never had the mindset or I was scared, you know. Um, and for me, the one of the biggest thing, I mean, I still get a bit of fear and, and I still get a bit of anxiety sometimes. But I know how to manage it now. I know how to deal with it now. And in the end, um, once you do that, it kind of sets you free a little bit. And it's like I said, it's so so much of an inspiration hearing your story because literally you've not just coped with one addiction. You've not just been through one addiction. You've been through well, the main ones really: drink, drugs, and alcohol. And to see you come out on the other side and now using that time to pass on help to others and I know you're looking at setting up or you, you are setting up your own um, sort of counselling and coaching business and if you just want to touch on that. Um, to yeah, so, so like I said, um, my life changed when I found a, a counsellor, a person who would had lived experience but also had the skills to get us to get us to the root cause of the problem, you know. I always found that the drink, the drugs and the gambling just papered over all the cracks. So by going in and speaking to a counsellor, and what made us open up in the first place with these counsellors was they shared their story a little bit. And it was like, I was like, wow, they're just like me, you know. They aren't going to judge me. They're not going to be judgmental. They're going to know my feelings and know when I say this happened, they'll understand it. Previously, the counsellors I'd had didn't have that. They didn't have that connection. They didn't have that understanding. You know, when you're going in to a counsellor saying, like, I've lost thousands and thousands of pounds, and she's saying, oh, well, just learn how to do it responsibly. 
Yeah. It's it's like a mental thing to hear, you know. Yeah. When all you want to say is, I'll, I'll help you get to the root cause of the problem so that we can change. Um, and since that day, it's just been a massive passion for me to want to help other people. Um, and I thought, I've got lived experience of three major addictions, really. If I can get some professional qualification and some sort of tools and ways to deal with other people in other ways, um, then it, then hopefully it'll put us in good stead, you know. So so I've, I've set up a, a counselling and coaching consultancy to try and help people who, who can relate to my story, who feel like, you know, um, they're going through similar to what I went through. And hopefully I can, I can lead by example, you know. I'm not just going to tell them what they should be doing. I'm going to help them understand what they can do to help themselves. Um, because there's no good pe- just preaching at people. There's no good just telling people what to do all the time because what I found, my experience, was as soon as somebody told us something to do, I would build a resistance up to doing it, you know. I'd get a resentment. I'd yeah. hold something against them. And ultimately, that always come back and bit us on the arse, you know, because every time I relapsed, I relapsed because it was somebody else's fault, yeah. you know, and I was just a complete victim. So, yeah, what I'm hoping for with me, with me new business is that People, people can relate to us and I can relate to them. Um, you know, if you've walked the walk and now you're, you're living in a different life, then I can be a bit of a role model, a bit of an example, but I can understand the feelings and stuff as well. So, so yeah, that's that's the goal. That's the, the new plan and that's where we're heading now, you know. So, How can people so yeah, get in touch? Yeah, so if anybody wants to get in touch or even just wants a little chat, then um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, so all I'm on all social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, Twitter is at Richie Paxton, uh, and Facebook and Instagram are Richie Paxton Counseling and Coaching. So yeah, if anybody wants to chat, wants to even just say this is where I'm at and wants a little bit of support in any way, then feel free to reach out and I'll help anybody any way I can, you know. And, and yeah. Um, Take the first step. It's the hardest one, but ultimately, it's the it's the most rewarding in the end, you know. And you know, living proof of that. And um, I'll I'll leave you uh, your links to your socials in the description below mm-hmm. if if you've not managed to catch that. Um, but yeah, I, I, from my experience, speaking to yourself would be very beneficial to to others out there who are struggling. And from a channel point of view, I, I just want to help other people. Just you know. In that way, I just want to spread the awareness of what addiction can do, um, and and hopefully by listening to my story, that of others and yourself, people will, look, as I said at the beginning, at very minimum, not feel alone, but hopefully pick up some good helpful advice and you know listening to stories. It, it, really, people out there, if you are struggling, talk, you know, make that first step as as Richie says, and I'm sure we can together help each other and, and hopefully ensure we, uh, we're not consumed by this addiction. Yeah, so, definitely. So, yeah, okay. Well, I'll thank you uh, for spending time on, on coming on and, and telling your story. Um, I'll leave it up to viewers if you want to comment and if you maybe want to part two with Richie, if, if, if you're up for that, maybe a shorter version uh, in future. But if, if you can leave a like, you leave a subscribe, leave a comment, it all helps the YouTube algorithm and we can get these videos in front of as many people as possible because obviously the lower of averages, the more people it's in front of, the more people, uh, the more chance it's got of hitting people who are struggling, who can benefit. So, much appreciated um, and hopefully Cheers. here's to a better 2021 20, then. And 20 but yeah thank you again for spending time and, and coming on yeah thanks very much thank you and um well done on setting up the channel you know it's i think it'll be very beneficial to a lot of people so yeah hats off to you cheers thank you right folks that's it for this installment and i'll catch you on the next one